yeah, with, with Warren's introduction, um, let's, let's, let's take the other one off, too. Okay. Just, yeah. What? Here's, let's take, let's take a, another one off, too, just to see if it's, that's a little brighter, I think, yeah. He sort of reminded me that um, I've been slowly working my way down the food chain uh, in my career, starting as a fish farmer for 15 years, coming to Cape Cod and really working with shellfish for the last 10 years, and now um, seaweed farming is sort of new to my research uh, end as well, but I think it's a very exciting new opportunity. So I'll be telling you a little bit about my, my first attempts and what, what we've learned in our first uh, summer of growing uh, seaweed in Wakoit Bay. So this is the Bacoit Bay. We're looking out um, from where I have my boat moored right here um, uh, in the foreground. And uh, I'm going to take you mentally to a, uh, a site off of Washburn Island, which is a state park uh, campground in Bacoit Bay, where um, the oyster farm and uh, seaweed farm is. Where's the next arrow? There we go. All right, so here's a bird's eye view, a 30,000 foot view of uh, Bacoit Bay. Um, you'll see on the left-hand side there uh, the snowman, kind of three parts of Wakoit Bay. Um, that white dot is where the, the oyster farm was that hosted our research project. And, uh, uh, and the, on the <coughs> photo on the right-hand side, you'll see where the two seaweed lines actually were laid out. <coughs> Excuse me. They're about each about a, a meter, 100 meters long. You can barely make out a series of white um, lobster buoys that form the north line and this line right there is uh, where we put the south line and um, the reason we set these two lines in two different places <coughs> is we wanted to check the effect of uh, growing the seaweed right next to the oysters so we had one area in the south cove here that was sort of surrounded by oysters and uh, what the seaweed would do if, how would it grow any differently away from the oysters and we had some theories about that, which I'll share in a minute. So just a general outline of um, what I'm going to tell you, uh, show you today is uh, why, we, why we conducted the project the way we did. A little bit of background on the species of seaweed that we grew. Um, some of the objectives of the project, uh, our how-tos, basically the methods we used, results, and um, uh, help you figure out uh, with, with me what should we do next. So first, uh, some of the net rationale here. Um, eutrophication is an awfully big word, but it really means what's, it's, what's the, the cause of spoiling all our coastal ponds here. It's basically we've got a little bit of nitrogen going into our, our ponds historically. It's now becoming a lot of nitrogen as housing is built up, as septic systems are, are leaching nitrogen into the groundwater, and it's all flowing into uh, our estuaries. Um, a healthy uh, estuary on the left there has uh, um, you know wonderful sandy, sandy sediments that has eelgrass. It's really the nurseries that are providing a lot of our, our the, the strength of our fisheries. Um, and sadly, when you get more and more nitrogen, you have this proliferation of algae, both microalgae and and macroalgae, um, that often settle to the bottom, suffocate the bottom, uh, crowd out the the, the seagrasses and leave a bunch of anoxic mud, which aren't very good for the benthic uh, shellfish either. So this is a process that's been slowly happening over the last 50 years, and it's really coming to a crisis level, and we need to do something about it. So uh, potentially growing oysters, shellfish, and seaweeds are both ways, uh, directly and indirectly, that we can remove nitrogen, and I'll describe that in a moment. So going back to uh, high school chemistry, we can look a little bit at the nitrogen cycle and how it's uh, uh, involved in natural processes here, and how oysters and seaweed are really provide valuable ecosystem services. Um, I won't go through each of these, but basically, if you've got nitrogen flowing into our estuaries here, either in the form of ammonia, NH4+, plus, or, nit or nitrate, NO3, um, that becomes food for phytoplankton. And so you get phytoplankton blooms, um, which can be wonderful for the oysters that filter the, fee, filter the phytoplankton and turn it into food. And they, they take that nitrogen that uh, was once in the water, becomes embodied in the phytoplankton, and they put it into their tissues. The nitrogen is the building block of protein, of course. So as these oysters grow, they're sequestering nitrogen. And 
we take the nitrogen out of the water and we take the oysters out of the water and we consume them. So that's the way the nitrogen is getting removed with shellfish. With seaweeds, it's, it's more direct. Seaweeds can actually utilize the ammonia and the nit nitrite, or nitrate rather, um, directly. They, they like, like the microalgae or the phytoplankton, can use that directly to grow their tissues and proteins. Um, and so when we harvest seaweed, we take, it, we take the nitrogen right out of the, the ponds directly. Um, if the seaweed isn't harvested, then it decomposes and it goes into the sediments and it just, the nitrogen just gets recycled right in the estuary. So buildup of macroalgae in estuaries can actually be a problem in that it, it, just, it, just, it doesn't go away. It just stays in the sediments and it gets reabsorbed the next year that a crop <coughs> grows. Excuse me. So <coughs> there's a general figure we can use for how much nitrogen is removed when oysters are harvested. It's about 0.2 grams of nitrogen per oyster. And with seaweeds, it's about 0.0035 grams of nitrogen per gram of seaweed. And later at the end of my talk, I'll, I'll describe what this sort of means on a, on a, a larger or you know, per estuary or per acre uh, basis. Um, seaweeds, of course, have all sorts of applications. We, we've heard about them you know, being parts of our ice cream and, and they're um, you know, typically emulsifiers. Um, they, they provide the ecosystem services I just mentioned. And in some areas, uh, like in the Carolinas and Chesapeake, they're beginning to develop nitrogen credits. So there are actually, you can actually put some value on harvesting seaweeds or harvesting shellfish. And like there's a carbon trading market now, there are slowly locally being developed nitrogen trading markets. And that might be something that, that uh, uh, politicians and, and planners on, on the vineyard on Cape Cod may want to consider at some point. Um, so hydrocolloids, cosmeceuticals, sea vegetables, another use for seaweeds, which I'll talk about a little bit um, from my perspective. And uh, not in the very near future, but people are, work, are working very feverishly at potentially creating biofuels from, from seaweeds, because it's a great source of uh, biomass that could be turned into biofuels. <clears throat> so this is the mouthful of species that I'm working with. It's called Gracilaria tikvahe. And it's a, it's a native species to, uh, uh, to New England, and I'll show you something about its distribution in a minute. It's usually quite red. And um, Aviva, did you bring a sample? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, we're, we're, go ahead and pass that around if it's uh, something. Yeah. Um, Aviva's an intern who's been working with me this uh, fall, and, and she kindly came on the last theory and <laughs> brought some fresh grass layer you can, you can take a look at, feel. Um, this is growing in our tanks at this, at this time of the year. Um, it's found intertidally. It, it withstands a, a great range of uh, environmental conditions, uh, warm and cold, I mean, because it does survive year round. Uh, and it can tolerate salinities in the low 20s, where seawater is usually around 30, 33. Um, it grows very fast in the summer, which is why we, one of the reasons we chose to uh, grow it. And um, it has potential commercial use as uh, a in seaweed salads or as an animal food. <clears throat> so the pictures on the bottom here, you'll see what it, this is, this is sort of the, the natural form you'll find it in the, uh, in the coastal ponds. It's long and stringy. Um, it can be, as I say, you can see the different color variations there. Why my voice is <clears throat> not caring here. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's when it's bundled up and attached to our ropes, which uh, I'll, I'll describe further. So a little bit about the geographic distribution. Um, grass area extends from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to southern Maine. And there's a little bit of it up there in the Gulf of St. Lawrence as well. Um, there's locally, or, or recently, in the last 10 or 20 years or so, a, a non-native species of grass area has started to take root in some of our estuaries. And it hasn't been a great worry, except that it is more aggressively growing. So if, if, if you're worried about uh, the proliferation of macroalgae is gumming up our estuaries. It could be a, could be a problem. Um, but you can't distinguish it just to look at it from our native species. You have to, you have to subject it to a DNA test. Um, and you can see by the, all these black marks here, the black circles represent where all the invasive has been discovered. And, and uh, so it's all over New England right now. It's invasive from Europe. From Europe. Um, 
Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what we were trying to do. Um, we were, we're, you know, on the grand scale, we wanted to show that, that seaweeds could be useful for removing nitrogen and also provide um, a potential economic uh, benefit by mar being a marketable product. But we wanted to find out in, in a constructive way um, how to scientifically figure out what's the best way to grow it. And, um, and would, it, would it work with growing with oysters? Because that's sort of a natural fit to have shell fishermen, shellfish farmers, make it a part of their, their lease. They've already got the rights to use the water there. Could they grow oysters and seaweeds at the same time? Two, two, two uh, bonuses for this same effort. Um, so first of all, we wanted to collect just the local strain. So we had to, uh, I'll show another slide where we did that. Um, we wanted to compare, as I sort of already mentioned, how the seaweed grew near the oysters in a way. And then, like any good agronomist, if you were handed some seeds that you didn't know anything about, you want to know, okay, so how far apart should I space these in my garden? And when's the best time to plant them? And uh, you know, how often should I harvest? Well, these are the kind of questions we were asking. How deep should we plant the seaweed? You know, near the surface or deeper? Um, how, how, how far apart should we plant them so that they proliferate and don't crowd each other? And then we wanted to look at the harvest interval. Could we harvest them every two weeks, every four weeks, or more? Um, and finally, we were going to sample all along, every time we harvest, some, put some tissue aside and, and analyze it for nitrogen later so we could see just how much nitrogen we removed. So the first step was to uh, go throughout Wakoit Bay. All, those, all the yellow squares there um, are where we collected samples. So we took, uh, 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 went right throughout and, and got these samples, sent them to our collaborators at the University of Connecticut. And the gentleman on the, on the bottom right here is Charlie Yarish. He's sort of the godfather of uh, seaweed aquaculture science uh, in New England. He's been doing it for 35 or 40 years or so. Behind him is, is um, former postdoc, now also a research associate, John Kim at the uh, University of Connecticut. Well, they, they, um, they took our, our samples and did the DNA test, and they found that all we, we had, everything was native except for one, one site, and it's the most heavily impacted, most eutrophic site, uh, the Child's River, which is sort of a, a classic uh, example of eutrophication gone bad. Uh, it's kind of curious that this invasive species would only be there, but at least with our sampling. <clears throat> the next step, oh, and so they also selected, they, they, they compared these 12 strains and they, they uh, looked at the early growth rate and they selected the two fastest strains for us to try growing. Um, so cultivating grass salaria, what, you know, you collect your strains, what do you do next? Well, you have a choice of either growing it sexually or vegetatively. This is the morass of what you'd have to do to, to grow grass laria sexually. Um, it's very complicated. There's all sorts of intermediate stages. And frankly, um, it's much more simply to, simply to do it vegetatively, just the way you would do with cuttings in, in the garden um, to start a new plant. That's what we do. So we avoid all this stuff here, which I'm not going to try to go through because it's far too complicated. And uh, we just do a vegetative culture. So, you want to start with a very clean culture because sometimes the grass layer you collect from the wild might have other epiphytes and other things growing on it. So you just excise the very tips of the grass layer, which is the growing apical meristem, and you put it in your, uh, in your, your beaker at the bottom there and uh, let them grow. And slowly you get plants that look like what is, what's being passed around here, fully grown plants. You grow them up in, uh, in jars and eventually we we just decant them into tanks to get up enough mass to plant out uh, in the early summer. Um, so we had one other intermediate stage between those, those car glass carboys. We have these uh, glass, uh, sorry, plastic or fiberglass uh, uh, K-tubes. And then uh, here's Charlie and Jang visiting us in, uh, at our outside tanks uh, where we're growing. I think we had to grow about 20 kilograms last summer before we had enough to plant out. Um, so every week, this stuff, as I say, it grows fast. Every week is doubling in its mass. So that's uh, pretty, pretty good. So here's a, here's a side view of what the architecture of a seaweed farm or growing system looks like. Um, 
We have buoys on the surface, which in our case were just lobster buoys. Uh, descending from each of the lobster buoys is a line with a brick on the bottom. And uh, the brick just sort of holds a, it just gives you a platform in which to string this kind of rope. So these are, we had experimental units. This is not what, the way you grow grass area commercially. These are quite short, right? But we just wanted to put about 10 or 20 bundles on, on a, a length of rope like this and either hang it at 2 meters from the surface or 0.6 meters from the surface. And uh, so we also had anchors sort of suspending the whole thing in a, in a straight line. These are nice quick connect things you can take off and off the, on and off those lines that uh, extend down to the bricks. So with the fisheye lens, you can see that we've just uh, deployed our, our lobster buoy line there. Uh, in the foreground is uh, the oyster farm owner, Todd. And uh, that was a great day to know that we finally got the structure out there. Well, that's just the beginning. Once we, all we had was the lobster buoys and the lines just dropping down and the anchors. Now we had to put all the bundles of grass larry onto this line. And uh, there's some people in the audience who can tell you this is not an easy thing the first time you do it. It's, it takes a lot of time. Okay, so just, just, to, just to remind you where we are, um, we've got a, a line to the north, a line to the south, and we're in McCoy Bay. So the bundling um, required, in our case, we were trying to start with precise 20 gram bundles. We wanted to know just what our beginning weight was so we, when we harvested, we could say, oh, it grew this much. Um, so you, you take your bundles, take your, your lengths of uh, grass laria, lay them together onto a, a scale and tie them up. And then one person would take this weave and open it up so that there's a gap like this and the other would stuff the bundle in. And so the bundle is folded in such a way that all the growing tips are sticking out of the, this weave, suspended in there, and the growing tips are what are sucking up the nitrogen and making the, making the uh, seaweed grow. So you can see this is, you know, the bundles are about the size of my fist um, once they're all on the line there. Here we are planting the units uh, in the South Cove there. To the left is Emma Green Beach. Where is she? My trusty research assistant. And uh, intern Morgan here helped me out this last summer. So here we are putting them at different depths. Now we're, we're harvesting. And you'll note the size. Those, are, those bundles there are quite a bit bigger than, than fists now, um, just after, after two weeks. You'll also note the color is much lighter than the deep red that you probably saw being passed around here. Um, that's, a, that's a sign that there was actually not enough nitrogen to fulfill all their, 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 uh, their growth needs. So while it grew fast, it probably could have grown faster and more nitrogen rich. Um, it, it, the more, the deep, deeper the color, the more nitrogen is in the tissues. Um, also helping uh, here with our, our harvest is Molly Beals, I mean Molly Peach, who's back here in our audience as well. And uh, this, was a, this was a great day when the, the first time we harvested, uh, we, we really got some wonderful numbers and, and the, the seaweed was so clean and we made so many great seaweed salads out of it. It was, it was great. Okay, so just a reminder, the, the objective is looking at the, the growth before and away, I mean uh, with and away from the oysters, the different depths, the different, the different planting, spacing and the harvest uh, intervals. I'm going to show you a, a series of slides now. Ugh, I need to lip wet my lips. And uh, so keep these objectives in mind. So the first surprising result was that uh, the seaweed actually grew better away from the oysters, or at least on the north side, than on the south side. So. Uh, just to give you a reference of what this, these graphs are looking at. On the x-axis, um, you're looking at the gram average weight of the bundles, okay? So the blue line on the, on the bottom here, that's where we started. All the bundles were about 20 grams. And uh, you can see that we got two and four times as much 
gross growth over uh, the first two weeks there. Um, so on the bottom, it's a, it, the uh, nomenclature there is N 0 0.210. That means north side 0.2 meters depth deep and 10 centimeter spacing. So you see that all the north ones on the far left there, uh, on average, were, were, uh, grew faster than the ones on the south. And the same here in the next uh, two week interval. So that was surprising. And I'll, I'll come to some, I'll tell you why I think that was in a, in a moment. Um, the other result, which was not so surprising, was that uh, uh, the shallower uh, depths provided faster growth than the deeper depth. And this makes sense from the standpoint of um, more irradiance or more light, more energy produces faster growth. Uh, there was more shading the deeper you got. The, uh, the 20 centimeter spacing grew slightly faster than 10 centimeter spacing, but on the, on the whole, it wasn't, the, it wasn't very different. And if you're going to try to get the most yield per square foot, um, you might as well go with a 10 centimeter spacing because it, it, it's, it's, the difference is very slight. So we got the same results pretty much on the north and south lines, but you'll see that the, the differences were, were slight. Um, and then the two week old bundles grew faster on average than the four week old bundles. And we think that was probably because we were getting competition with fouling organisms. And uh, um, that was probably the principal reason. So it didn't really matter much whether you're on the north side or the south side. There was one anomaly here. This thing, this uh, one group on the south, I can't explain. But it, uh, this was the shallower depth. So perhaps uh, on the south side, um, the shallower depth uh, compensated for the, the, uh, the spacing. Now there was a, a general trend of, uh, of slower growth as the summer drew on. Um, the uh, orange uh, dots there um, should show what the daily average percent growth rate was. Uh, you know, somewhere around the 10% per day in late June, early July when we started and uh, getting down to 5% or less uh, as the season got into September, October. Now that's not surprising that it would drop, particularly since um, you can see the temperature uh, dropped as well. It went up a little bit for a while and then from, from August on, it's slowly dropping down to uh, uh, you know, almost 10 degrees there. I'm sorry, 60 degrees. Um, the, uh, the blue daylight hours, is that blue, Aviva? I always forget. <laughs> No, that's, that's, yeah, I'm colorblind, so I had, to, I, had to, I had to get some coaching yesterday. I still blow it. Anyway, the pink, yes, obviously pink. Daylight hours, they're, they're, they're shortening too. So you expect growth rate to drop with both temperature and growth um, daylight. So a little bit about the fouling. Um, <clears throat> the, the, as I say, the, the four week didn't grow as well as the two week, so it really was a matter that the longer you cultivated this grassland area, um, it, it, you know, nature loves a free lunch uh, or a place to hide. And the tunicates uh, were uh, burying themselves in, into uh, and, and covering some of the, uh, uh, the bundles. There are also epiphytes, and that's what you see in the bottom left here. Um, our bundles are no longer distinct because they're all being covered by these epiphy epiphytical types of seaweeds, um, very fine hair type seaweeds. Uh, so that doesn't make for a very appealing product either. So it's better to plant often and harvest often if you're going to try to find a marketable product. Um, the bottom right here is, this is one of our labels that we had on the, uh, on the uh, line, and it's just covered with this colonial tunicate. But we think we might have come up with a solution to this. Um, we did this trial, we did some trials to see if we could combat the tunicates, uh, but it was started pretty late. We didn't try it till September. Um, but over the course of eight weeks, um, we did this uh, freshwater bath treatment. So why did we go that way? You know, what gave us that idea? Well, actually in conjunction with the project we have going on here in, on the vineyard with mussel farming, 
Um, we've been looking at ways to avoid taking mussel seed that might be fouled with tunicates from our coastal ponds here and moving them out into the open ocean where the farms are. Um, so we've teamed up with a, uh, a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute who's a tunicate uh, whisperer, or a biologist extraordinaire. She knows how to, how to uh, uh, combat them and uh, she suggested that we try with the, with the mussel seed uh, a variety of different treatments. And the freshwater one was the one that, that seemed to, to uh, not affect the mussel survival but kill the tunicates. So we said, well, let's try that with our, with our seaweed. So we did this uh, two treatments, 15-minute um, freshwater bath, just, just sinking the seaweed into the freshwater once a week. Um, we did another treatment where we do it, where some bundles were treated twice a week, and we did some that weren't treated at all. <clears throat> And so we had three bundles here that were uh, twice a week, three once a week, and these three, no, no treatment at all. And you can see the difference here. No tunicates on the twice a week treatment, one tunicate on the once a week treatment, and 40 tunicates on the controls. So clearly the freshwater um, dips had uh, uh, significant effect. And we will tr probably, at the first sign of any tunicate problems next summer, we'll probably try this with our experimental lines. And, see if uh, we can produce more marketable product without affecting growth. So we'll, we'll track growth too, which we didn't do in this late season trial. So um, <clears throat> what's next? Uh, we didn't get started till late June last year. We, did, we, we, we didn't really anticipate just how long it would take to build up that 20 kilograms of, uh, of product to plant out. We're way ahead of the game. We almost have five kilos now in our tanks indoors. Um, and we're hoping to get a, a planting out in May, which I think is a, uh, a better start. Um, that South Cove, uh, if you remember the, the picture of Wakoit Bay and the South Cove where we planted the, the seaweed near the oysters, well, we find that there's, there's a little bit of an eddy there. It's kind of a dead zone. There isn't as much water flowing past there, which means there's not as much nitrogen flowing past there. We think that, that the reason that the South Cove or the oyster site um, for our seaweed didn't grow as well is because there wasn't enough nitrogen, there wasn't enough flow, and uh, the, the, south si the north side had more um, new nutrients flowing past it all the time, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why it may have grown faster. So we're going to move, we're not going to use the, the South Cove site this time, we're going to move it out closer to the, to the channel where uh, it'll still be surrounded by oysters, but it'll get much more water flow. Um, we'll continue with our experiments to avoid the fouling. Uh, try to see if we can find up ways to speed up uh, um, putting the lines in and out. And uh, currently we're, we're, we're doing some pilot experiments with sugar kelp, uh, uh, a species that we think would really complement the, the seaweed farming that we do with grass larry in the summertime. Kelp is really a winter crop and um, it uh, it, would, it makes sense because many of the shellfish farmers who might be doing some of the seaweed farming, they're not doing as much in the winter either. And, um, and frankly, any kind of seaweed farming tends to take up the real estate that it occupies. You can't do a lot of boating over there because you're usually fairly shallow. With kelp, it might be a little different because you can, you can set these, the kelp at about six feet deep and it'll still grow quite prolifically. You can still boat over that is what I'm, what I'm getting at. But we've got, uh, we've got some kelp out with a, a mussel farmer in uh, Narragansett Bay right now. That's the picture on the left there. Me holding this little seed string of, of new kelp sporlings that we got from the University of Connecticut. And I've got kelp in, uh, the center picture is uh, Woods Hole um, Great Harbor. Uh, there's a mooring ball on the left side there and you'll see the two black balls. Between those two black buoys is a 20 foot stick of PVC and hanging down from that is uh, uh, a line that has got kelp on it. So come April, May this year, we'll see just how well that grew. And then I've, I've got another seed string um, in Wakoit Bay, which is a little bit of a risk because nobody, you don't generally find kelp growing in, in coastal ponds. Um, I don't know how it's going to do. That's the only risk is that I think it might be a flop, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. So the, the Wakoit Bay, picture, which I'll show you a little bit in, in greater detail of what, what are the nitrogen pressures and it's probably not too different from some of the ponds here, um, has a tremendous amount of nitrogen going into it. That's where you'd like to do any kind of seaweed farming 
or oyster farming because those are the bo water bodies that are truly impacted. So I will be really pleased if the kelp takes off, but uh, we'll see because it, it, the winter time is when the nitrogen is most available. Okay, so <clears throat> trying to put my, 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 my project into the context of uh, bioremediation with seaweeds, taking out nitrogen, give you a little bit of um, some numbers to, to wrap your head around. Um, there's a heck of a lot of nitrogen going into Bacoit Bay. Um, I think there's about five times as much nitrogen as there was, say, in the 1930s. That's the level when you really need to get back to to have full ecosystem health back. But the, 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 we think if you can get it back to cut back 50%, you'll be, you'll be, uh, we, we can bring back eelgrass and, and perhaps scallops and more. So about 95 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare is flowing into Bacoit Bay. A lot, 32,000 kilos. The surprising figure is that 60% of that nitrogen is, is bound up in the seaweeds. All that macroalgae that's kind of like tumbleweed on the bottom of the bay um, is sequestering a heck of a lot of nitrogen. So harvesting it or competing with it via the seaweed culture or, or, sea, or oyster culture is a one way of uh, um, trying to remove this, this nitrogen bundle or, or load. Um, the Mass, Massachusetts Estuaries Project has been going around to all the estuaries that are, that are impacted in Massachusetts and trying to uh, come up with a figure of how much nitrogen needs to be removed so that towns can plan sewering or other, or there are other ways of removing nitrogen. <clears throat> and as I say, 53% of the nitrogen that's now going into Bacoy Bay would have to be removed to meet uh, uh, what, are, what will soon become state standards for repairing our waters. How much, um, how much wild seaweed is in a certain area of Wakoi Bay? We wanted, to, we wanted to answer that question, and, and it also reminds me of another reason why our lines here on the, in the South Cove, around where the oysters were, may not have grown so well. This big black patch here is all seaweed. It's all macroalgae that's about yay deep um, above the sediment. And um, it's all competing for the nitrogen that, that our seaweed was, was growing for, too. So that's maybe one of the reasons why it was so light colored and uh, why this south side didn't grow as well as the north side. But we actually took uh, on the left hand side there, you can see we have this, this sampler, sampling device that you can send down. It's a Ponar grab sampler that goes down. It, these big teeth close and, and uh, um, you can haul up, you know, a certain area, of how much seaweed you, you can um, remove or um, you can figure out how much seaweed is on the bottom. And we, we estimated that there are about 2.8 kilograms per square meter. And I did a rough estimate that this is probably about 2,400 square meters. Um, and how much seaweed that is, 6,700 kilograms. So that represents about 22 kilograms of nitrogen. Um, that's a tiny little plot in Wakoit Bay, but there are lots of plots like this that could be harvested or are, 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 are the sinks for the nitrogen right now. Um, you know, parallel to my efforts in, in uh, getting seaweed farming going, I'm also looking at the, the possibility of, of w harvesting wild seaweeds as a way of removing nitrogen from our coastal estuaries too. Not likely they will find markets for that in eating it, but it could be composted as, as, as uh, Warren mentioned, we've done in the past. And that might be a way to slowly remove or chip away at the, the, the nitrogen that's just getting recycled in our coastal estuaries and causing these problems. But to go on and look at what, did, uh, what can oysters and what, can, what did we actually remove in terms of nitrogen, um, let's compare seaweed to oysters for a moment. Oysters uh, well, we, we did a very extensive um, survey of oysters at this oyster farm to figure out, okay, what's the general size distribution, what's the dry tissue look like, and then we could equate the dry tissue to an actual amount of nitrogen per oyster, 0.27 grams of nitrogen per every marketable or harvest size oyster. In that little south cove, there's about 75,000 oysters, and they're harvesting those on an annual basis, and that's, that's 20 kilograms of nitrogen. Similar to the, the biomass of the 
seaweed that was also in that cove, which is interesting. If they were to take um, their tw entire 25-acre oyster farm and, and, and uh, they're projecting being able to sell and grow 3 million oysters a year, um, they'll be removing about 750 kilograms of nitrogen on that 25 acres. Now, um, I'm sorry, 750 kilograms of nitrogen. Uh, or that's also equivalent to 75 kilograms of hect per hectare of nitrogen. Now remember, 90 kilograms of nitrogen are coming in per hectare in, in Wakoit Bay. So um, it does get, begin to chip away at it, but uh, uh, you would have to have a whole lot of oysters. I didn't have the complete calculation to make a dent in, um, in the, uh, the nitrogen problem in, in Wakoit Bay. This is uh, also seen with our, our actual harvesting of seaweed in, in Wakoit Bay. We harvested 130 kilograms of uh, grass laria. That represents about half a, uh, a kilogram of nitrogen um, over the four months that we did this. If we had uh, grown our, all our grass laria at the optimum, temp, op, optimum depth and optimum uh, spacing, and uh, harvested it every two weeks instead of all our experimental design, we probably could have harvested closer to a, a thousand kilograms and removed more. So if we take this optimized uh, calculation and, and build out a theoretical optimized farm of a hectare, um, we could, with 33 lines, we could potentially move about 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So that's even more than the oyster farm was, was doing, I think, well, no, it's a little less, sorry. They were, they were doing 75 kilograms. So it's, it's on the same order of, uh, of uh, comparison, but uh, um, the oysters take, can take more than a year, and this can, this can be done in about four months. So if you were to take this to the next extreme, how much, you know, to remove, uh, you know, a sizable amount, 40% of the nitrogen that's flowing into Bokoit Bay, how many hectares would you have to plant with seaweed? It's a heck of a lot. 70% yeah. of the bay. Um, <laughs> you might be able to do that in China, where you know they, they do they do say this is this is important. We want all the seaweed. We got to feed people, but it's not going to happen in Wakoi Bay anytime soon. We have far too much, far too many other social values we uh, count on for our, our estuaries. Um, <clears throat> so. What about the, the business opportunity of growing seaweed and making it into a, you know, a seaweed salad business, for instance? Um, again, this is, this is based on the very pretty labor-intensive ways that we operated our research farm. Um, these costs could probably be lowered, uh, but for our farm for the summer, it, it would, it would, you know, for our, if it was a one hectare, we were doing this on a one hectare farm scale, it would be about $100,000 in labor. We could produce about 14,000 kilograms of saleable sea vegetables. And uh, you'd have to break, a uh, break even price on the sale would be about $7.50 a kilogram for seaweed. Um, which is not, you know, we, <laughs> we've been in touch with a guy who's growing this type of seaweed, grass layer, in his garage in Austin, Texas. And he's selling it to local markets there at twelve and fourteen dollars a kilogram. So um, it's not uh, it's not out of the question that you couldn't could make a, a business out of this. And with that, I'd, I'd like to thank a whole host of people who um, who helped us. Uh, we, we had four interns: one who's here, Molly Peach. Um, about 40 volunteers who helped us uh, during the harvesting and bundling stages. Um, they were enticed with uh, seaweed salad and pizza to come and <laughs> help us. Um, my trusty research assistant, Emma Greenbeach, who's also in the audience. The staff at the Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve um, hosted our, our uh, mooring for our boat and gave us all sorts of data that were helpful in uh, <coughs> producing some of the slides. Um, uh, the oyster farm in Wakoit Bay generously helped us string out the, the lines to begin with and uh, the funding came from Woods Hole Sea Grant and um, University of Connecticut, as I say, is our, is our partners in all this. <laughs>